So, good evening to everybody. We are here to hear the second talk of the day uh, by Barry Smith from the University of London. And he will talk about the multi-sensory re responses to works of art today. I, I thank you very much, Barry, to be here at Unicinos, Philosophy Unicinos. And I thank you all to be present. And I think we should start. Yes, thank you very much. Sophia, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I should use this microphone, I think. Let me do that. OK, now I can use this microphone and start. So th thank you very much, Sophia. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's uh, a great pleasure to speak at Unicinos. And thank you for coming, especially at this time in the evening. Some of you I saw earlier. And you came back. That's wonderful. OK, so I want to talk about how we experience works of art, especially in a gallery or a museum. So we go to a gallery or a museum, and we think that we're just engaged in acts of looking. So it's very easy to suppose that when we stand there with the paintings in front of us, that all we're doing is using our eyes, that we're just having a visual experience. But what about the other senses that are at work? constantly while we're looking at artwork. It's not the case that we can turn the other senses off. It may be just that when we are in an art gallery and looking at paintings, we are focusing our attention more on visual experience. But that doesn't mean that our ears, uh, our, our touch, everything isn't still working. So I want you to think about the experiences you have when you're in a gallery. As you wander around a room like this, there is a, an echo, there's a sound, there's an acoustics that that room has. If you were in a smaller room or a room made of different materials, the sounds would be different. There's the temperature of the room, which you feel as well. There's also the feelings of your own body as you're moving around. How tired are you? Have you just come from a busy day fighting with local politicians, maybe, like Adriano? Is, is that what you've been through? So many, many things can affect you as you're going through an art exhibition. But these days, we often have things that happen in a gallery space. Many people will use a headset to give them information about the paintings, to, to hear about the works of art. And that's an interesting issue. Could it be that when we listen to headphones and they're telling us about the paintings we're looking at, is that putting us in two different spaces? There's the space of the voice that we're listening to, and there's the space of the paintings that we're looking at. Now, colleagues of mine in London, Ophelia Derois and Meryl Fairhurst, they performed an experiment that they did with the the Tate Gallery in London, and they gave people who were coming to the museum, they gave them the opportunity to participate in an experiment. And what they had was 10 uh, paintings, 10 or 12 paintings, portraits, just portraits of people's heads and faces. And as you went through the museum with, with the headsets, listening to information about the paintings, there were four different conditions. So sometimes when you're looking at a picture of a woman, it's a woman's voice in the headset. Sometimes you're looking at a woman's face and it's a man's voice. And sometimes you're listening to somebody speaking in the first person. So they're saying, do you see my hat? Do you notice the color of my dress? Behind me, there is a, a, a cabinet. So sometimes they're talking in the first person. Sometimes they're talking in the third person. The sitter is wearing a hat. She is painted with a, a red coat and so on. So there are four different conditions. Now, what they discovered was the following. If the voice matched the gender 
of the person in the painting. So male, portrait of a male, male voice, portrait of female, female voice, and if it was in the first person, as if the person in the painting was talking to you. Under that condition, exclusively, people remembered more about the painting a week later. They remembered more about the painting and they remembered more details, more details that weren't even mentioned in the audio guide. They weren't even given through the headset. So in other words, the hypothesis is that people were less distracted. They had less division of attention between the auditory space and the visual space, and that freed them up to give them more attention to the visual space. Okay, so we can be using our ears in a space in an informative way. But we don't just respond to paintings visually or even auditorily. Sometimes we respond to paintings with the whole of the body. Sometimes it's, it's almost as if you might feel the movement of something that you're looking at, as if you would feel it in you. And not only that, the surface of a painting or the surface of a work of art can have a texture. And you can imagine, even without touching it, you can imagine what it feels like to touch that surface. So this is another way in which you're using more senses to respond to paintings. But we have to remember that in not every museum is it always going to be visual art. So um, here's a very famous piece in one of your best and most beautiful museums, Inutim, uh, near Bella Horizonte. In Inutim, this is a piece of work by Janet Cardiff. It's a, f a, a they play the Thomas Tallis 40 voice motet, Speminalium. And each of these, each of these speakers, from there you hear a single voice in the choir. So you can go and listen to each one and hear that's a different voice. And when you stand in the middle, you hear the voices coming together. This is a better experience of this piece of music than you would even have in a concert hall because you couldn't be in exactly the right position. Fabulous piece of, fa fabulous piece of art. But you can also have, in this case, this is a, a, a museum in uh, Helsinki where they had a, a smell exhibition so people were going around and smelling. That was part of their engagement with a work of art. There's nothing visually to see except the jars which you lift the lid off and you smell them. But smell can be itself part of a, an exhibition of a work of art. So there can be sound, there can be sight, there can be smell. But I want to show you how these senses are always working together at the same time. They're not separate. They don't come individually. I mentioned this previously in, in the last talk, when you're having experience now of the world around you and of yourselves, you don't have a separate part of your conscious mind which is this is sight, this is hearing, this is touch, this is smell. They all occur in the same space. As you sit here now, you see me, you hear my voice, you might have a taste of coffee in your mouth. You've got the feel of the chair underneath you. You've got the feel of the internal state of your body. And all of that is part of a single unified conscious experience that you're having now. It's not the case that they come individually partitioned. So why should we expect that when you look at works of art that you could turn off many of these senses and you could just have one? So here's a Here's something I want to concentrate on a little bit. This is a scene from a, a, a museum. It's called the Kelvin Grove Art Gallery and Museum. It's in Glasgow in Scotland, my hometown. And here is what is very interesting to all the Glaswegians. When you see this museum, and indeed when you're in the museum, you're very aware of the smell of that museum. So much so, and I'm sure you can think of how museums that you like to visit, galleries you like to visit, you can think of their smell, and it's unique and distinctive. But the smell of this museum was so special and distinctive that when Glasgow Council decided they were going to have refurbishment, they were going to re, re, uh, rework some of the building, 
and it was going to be closed for four years, and they were spending 40 million pounds to renovate it. The Glaswegians all said, don't change the smell, don't change the smell, because they had been there as children, and they remembered it, and they took their, they came back as adults, and they took their own children there, and it always reminds them. They have memories that are built up of this place and of its collection of artworks, which come with that special smell. It's a smell of furniture polish and old stone, and it's very distinctive. And I'm always using this example. When I take people to Glasgow, I say, come and see this museum. And they walk in, they say, ah, ah, yes. Very distinctive. So we're affected by many things as we move around an art gallery. And also, we tend to think that a work of art has its aesthetic properties just because of what we're looking at on the screen. But the experience of that work of art also depends on where it is. Where is it in the museum? What surrounds it? So here's one of Glasgow's very famous pieces. It's a portrait by, it's a piece by Salvador Dali, uh, The Crucifixion of Christ. Very unusual Dali painting, but there it is. Um, and that painting was, again, a favorite of people who visited the museum. But they eventually, in making the renovation, they moved it from this space where people enjoyed it to this space, where they didn't enjoy it quite as much. Interesting, there was something about the lighting, something about the setting that wasn't right, so they went back here because people preferred it with that blue surrounding. It's a small room, you walk in, you feel it's very small and confined. There's something about that that's part of the experience of the painting. It's not just the painting. And also notice, when it was here, it was in the corridor. It wasn't in its own small room. And you could hear the noise of feet walking past. And somehow that changed it, whereas there was a carpet in the other room. It was soft. You didn't hear noise. That was all part of the experience of the painting. Now, here's one of my favorite works from that collection. This is Rembrandt Portrait of a Man in Armor. And I've known this painting for a very long time, and I remember it, it was on show at a museum in London, and it was lent to that museum for an exhibition. And I thought, oh good, I'll go and see it. And I didn't know why at the time, but I went to see it, and I didn't feel the same about it. I didn't have the same appeal, because what I wasn't realizing was how much of my experience of that canvas was also about the setting, perhaps the smell, perhaps the sounds of the museum it was in. So all of these things can affect us. All of these things are part of our experience of a work of art. Let's go back to touch. Let's go back to this idea that we can not just see a painting, but almost feel it, almost feel what it's like. So here's a very interesting quote from Merleau-Ponty. One sees the hardness and the brittleness of glass. When, with a tinkling sound, it breaks, this sound is conveyed by the visible glass. One sees the springiness of steel, the ductability of red-hot steel, the hardness of a plain blade, the softness of shavings in the jerk of the twig which a bird has just, from which a bird has just flown, we read its flexibility and elasticity. And it is thus that a branch of an apple tree or birch are immediately distinguishable. One sees the weight of a block of cast iron which sinks in the sand, the fluidity of water and the viscosity of syrup in the same way. I hear the hardness and unevenness of cobbles in the rattle of a carriage, and we speak appropriately of a soft, dull, or sharp sound. So what he's pointing to, beautiful passage, what he's pointing to is this sensory blending, the fact that one sense blends with another. When you talk about a sharp sound, sharp is a feel but it's easy to think of it as applying to a sound, soft as well. So this way in which we anticipate what we're seeing or looking at as to how it will feel, 
how it will break, how it will move. So Merleau-Ponty says, synesthetic perception is the rule and we are unaware of it only because scientific knowledge shifts the center of gravity of experience so that we have unlearned how to see, hear, and generally speaking, feel in order to deduce from our bodily organization and the world as the physicist conceives it, what we are to see, hear, and feel. But is it actually sensory blending or is it what we call cross-modal matching? Okay, so cross-modal matching is when there are properties you experience in one modality which have an effect on or a correspondence to something in a different sense modality. So here's something many of you will have seen. Here are two shapes. One of them is booba, one of them is kiki. Which one is booba? Yes, that one? Okay, good. Now, that is almost universal, almost universal. People say, yeah, that's, that's booba, that's kiki. If you take this, as Charles Spence and colleagues did, if you take it to Namibia and you take it to a, a, a culture who don't have language, don't have written language, don't have writing, still you say to them, which one's booba, which one's kiki, they say booba. If you say it to a four-year-old child, they say booba. It's kind of wired into us in some curious way. And not only that, these things are so arbitrary. They're incredibly arbitrary. So here's another one that looks, that looks very, very weird. Okay, I'm going to ask you to put lemons on a scale between fast and slow. Where are lemons? Which are lemons, fast or slow? Fast, right. And again, that's just about universal. Lemons are fast. Banana, slow, very slow. So notice this isn't the same as synesthesia because synesthesia is where people have unusual associations between, say, a sound and a color or between a letter and a color. This is something we all share. This is something much more kind of common. Go back to Merleau-Ponty's point about looking at objects and thinking you know how they feel. These glasses, they look fragile. They look as though they're too delicate. Imagine somebody asked you to pick up a tray with these glasses on it or to reach your hand in and find the one in the middle. You would be a little nervous. And the Brazilian philosopher Andre Abath from uh, uh, University Federal de Minas Gerais uh, says this in a recent paper. He says, imagine this, while window shopping for antiques, John's attention is caught by a set of 19th century Victorian glasses. They are far too expensive, so he does not dare ask if he can touch them, but in his mind he is carefully touching them right now as he gets lost in his imaginings, he can almost feel the contours of their decorations, the hardness and the brittleness. That's kind of right. You can sort of feel that, right, just by looking at them. Almost feeling also shares something with feeling and might actually activate similar areas in the somatosensory cortex. It might be that we're in imagining how they feel, we're actually activating some of the same areas that would be exercised if we were feeling them. So let's go back to how we use all of these senses when we just look at a work of art. How is the room affecting us? How is the noise affecting us? How is all of that relevant? Well, this matters because, this matters a lot because we have to concentrate on this triangle there's an object which may or may not be a work of art, but there's a relation between the, the work and the object, but that relation cannot be fixed, I would argue, without putting in the experience that we have. So to experience a work of art, you have to experience an object, but what is it that makes the work 
That might be more than just the object. It might be the object in a setting, in a surrounding, with noise, with light, with all sorts of things, okay? And it might not just be an object, it might be objects. This is becoming an important issue for people in the work of, in the field of conservation. So conservationists in museums and galleries, they are scientists who work to make sure that a painting is kept in perfect condition. They work on the frame, they work on the, the surface, they might clean a painting, they might make small changes and adaptations. But in some works, you might sometimes have to replace some of the parts and put new parts in place to make sure that the work is still in view. It's not the case that you always have to have the same object. Here's an example recently. There is a museum in Amsterdam which has got a piece of art called the Sea Comet, the Comet of the Sea. And it's a set of photographs in the shape of a comet. And it's printed photographs, and they're of blue sea. And the photographs have now started to fade. And they said to the artist, what shall we do? The conservators said to the artist, what shall we do? And he said, just print some more photographs from the negatives. And they said, really? And he said, yeah. So they've printed and they've put some of those photographs in place and taken others away. And eventually, they'll have a room with all the original photographs and then the new ones on display. Which is the work of art? This is familiar to philosophers as the ship of Theseus. It's exactly like the ship of Theseus, but it's a real-life example. And people in the world of insurance who want to insure a work of art say, well, which is the work of art? Is it that one in the basement, the original photographs, or is it this one you have on show? So notice that we are now having to do many things to change. And this is getting more serious when we now think of not just objects, but media like film or sound. So an awful lot of, an awful lot of film uh, artworks on 16 millimeter and 32 millimeter, the film is starting to decay. So you'll now transfer that film to video. Is it the same work of art? Well, some people would say, that's okay, as long as you change the object or change the medium to make sure that the work is still available, keep the work alive, it'll do. But there's a famous piece by Bruce Nauman. It's a little film of spinning steel balls, and they just spin and they're mirrored. And when people saw this piece, they had an experience of Nauman's work. And when the film started to fade, Nauman said, just, just put it on video and just show it on video now. So the, the Tate Gallery did this. They put the video on, or I think this was actually in MoMA in New York. They put the video on, and people said, it's not the same because we used to hear the noise of the reel of the film, click, 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 as we watched the film. And Nauman said, the artist said, just put a soundtrack on. And people hate it, because <laughs> they know that sound is not coming from the video recorder, okay? So there's, it's not always the artist who will be describing how to keep a work of art alive, even though we might think, well, we'll consult the artist and their practice. That might not decide the issue. There's a difficult issue, and it's a real issue. And I think philosophers and metaphysicians should be involved in working with museums and galleries to come up with policies. What, 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 how should we now think about collecting works of art and changing objects to keep works of art in view? But the experience of those works matters. And of course, there's the context. There's the context in which you have the experience. But also what we mean by the experience of that work of art is dependent on neural mechanisms in us. So the perception of an artwork processed at first visually that gives rise to an aesthetic experience depends on many factors having to do with biology and culture, our prior knowledge, familiarity, the context of viewing, and we need to study context and mechanism in order to understand the nature of those experiences that are partly constituting 
a work from the experience of an object or objects. Okay. So the focus has largely been on visual artworks, on works that are first visually and then cognitively processed, but somatosensory, motor, chemosensory, visceral and affective processes are all in place to condition the aesthetic experience you have to res in response to a work of art. Now, just to show you a little bit about what prior knowledge means, um, this is a little, little example from predictive processing, if you, if you like. First time I saw this, you look at this and at first it's a little difficult to work out what's going on. And then you realize slowly, slowly that those are ears on the head. Because of course, your expectations are they should be hair. Your expectation of where an ear is is it should be here. It should be just two of them. So it takes you a while. You look and it's, it's a little bit of effort. Now that's interesting because that's an, a work that's deliberately playing against something we know is going on, that visually you will parse it, you will process it with all your expectations of what a head looks like, and then you'll have to revise. And of course, a lot of very abstract sculpture and painting is all about defying expectations. You have got no prior expectations that help you with this. What the hell am I to do with that? This is the slide I always show when I talk about the Internet of Things. I imagine, <laughs> imagine this. Okay, that's the Internet of Things. Um, so how do we process artworks? Well, here are two of my uh, colleagues from London, one of them an ex-colleague now, uh, the art historian David Friedman and the neuroscientist Vittorio Galesi, who were working together. They were interested in how the brain and the body responds to visual images and the fact that we don't just respond to visual images visually, the fact that we're using far more. And this is what um, Galesi calls embodied simulation. So he says, the discovery of mirror neurons and a variety of mirroring mechanisms in, 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 our, in us demonstrated that the same neural structures activated by the actual execution of an action or by the subjective experience of emotions and sensations are also active when seeing others acting or expressing the same emotions and sensations. Do you all know what mirror neurons are? Yeah, or shall I just say? So mirror neurons first discovered in uh, in the brain of the monkey, these are neurons which fire when you go to, say, pick up a bottle. But the very same neurons fire when the monkey is watching someone else pick up a bottle. So in other words, the neurons you use to perform an action are the very neurons that you activate to represent what's happening. It's as if you know what you would be doing if you were performing that action. So these are mirror neurons. Now, Galesi says we don't just have them for uh, actions, for movements, we also have them for emotions. So when, I, when I'm walking down the corridor in Unisinos and somebody smiles, I'm walking past and somebody smiles, I activate the neurons in my brain that would control my facial gesture to make the same gesture, and because that facial gesture is connected to my emotions of happiness, then I can recognize that what I'm seeing in someone else is that emotion, that's the idea. So embodied simulation is also engaged when actions, emotions, and sensations are displayed as static images in the case of works of art. So here's an image that David Friedberg always likes to use. This is a Caravaggio. I don't give you the full image because it's too grisly. This is Caravaggio's painting of Thomas, doubting Thomas, uh, examining the wound of Christ. And the finger is right in the wound, right in there. And it's so accurately painted that you cannot see this painting in full without feeling a little twinge here, a little discomfort in your own side. It's, it's, it, mm, it's a little bit uncomfortable. 
And Friedberg and Galesi, in a Tick's paper, wrote, a crucial element of aesthetic experience of artworks consists of the activation of embodied simulations of actions. In other words, we put ourselves into those actions and emotions and corporeal sensations. And these mechanisms are universal. Embodied simulation in aesthetic experience, empathy for pain, the viewing of images of punctured or damaged body parts activates part of the same network of brain centers that are normally activated by our own sensation of pain, accounting for the feeling of physical sensation and corresponding shock upon observation of pressure or damage to the skin, skin and limbs of others. Friedberg likes to show this too. He said it's hard to look at this, this um, small sculpture of the maudlin without feeling in your own body the tension and the agony and the kind of <clears throat> extreme expression of emotion. So Friedberg, David Friedberg, the art historian, believes that we must turn to neuroscience to help us understand how we respond to bodies and emotions in images and artworks. That we can't just talk about the historical context, who painted it, why it was painted, who are the figures in the painting. We must also use neuroscience to illuminate the engagement and response and experience that we have to artworks. So he says, Automatic empathetic responses constitute a basic level of response to images and to works of art. Underlying such responses is the process of embodied simulation that enables the direct, direct experiential understanding of the intentional and emotional content of images. This basic level of reaction to images becomes essential to any understanding of their effectiveness as art. Historical and cultural or contextual factors do not contradict the importance of considering the neural process that arise, processes that arise in the empathetic understanding of visual works of art. So we need to consider the role of the motor system in observing visual art. Here's another of Friedberg's fav favorite pieces. This is uh, uh, Van der Weyden's uh, deposition of Christ from the cross. And what's so interesting is how much we already tacitly or implicitly know about this. You'll see the, the position of, of the Christ figure is mirrored by, um, by Mary as she, her body's in exactly the same position. And that's inviting the viewer to feel the same feeling of, of agony, of, of expression of collapse and grief and so on. This was known, this is implicitly known, and painters used it. So these are mirroring acts. So the observation of a static image of an action can activate a motor response in the observer. They're responding to it not as visual scene only, but as the trace of an action, understood motorically by the perceiver. So roughly speaking, when you see historical paintings of an action, a scene of action, you're not just seeing a visual scene, you're seeing a trace of an action that was performed and you respond in your motor system by feeling and knowing what it is to perform that action. It's terribly important. So uh, Galesi and colleagues say, vision is part of a multimodal experience that takes in activation of the motor system, somatosensory, and viscera motor regions of the brain. This is what I was talking about, that we're using all of our sensory systems when responding. It's not so selective as just vision or just hearing, okay? So the involvement of the body in our response is there, but other senses too. And that whole internal milieu, how you're feeling inside when you wince a little bit at the pain or you, you look at that touching of the flesh and poking into the side, and you feel something in your own gut, that's not just an accompaniment, that's part of the response to that work of art, that's constituting the work, and it was there to conjure that response, to provoke that response in you. Here's, uh, here's uh, Galesi, and again, 
the apparent imitation of the actions represented within a work of art or suggested by the implied movements involved in its making, mirror neurons also offer the possibility of a clearer understanding of the relationship between responses to the perception of movement within painting, sculpture, and architecture, and not just in their anthropomorphic or figurative modes and the emotions that such works provoke. Okay, our brains, our brains can reconstruct actions by merely observing the static graphic outcome of an agent's past action. This reconstruction process during observation is an embodied simulation mechanism that relies on the activation of the same motor systems required to produce the graphic sign. We predict that similar results we will be obtained using as stimuli artworks that are characterized by the particular gestural traces of the artist in Fontana and Pollock. Viewing cuts and viewing lines gives rise to quite different cortical responses in the viewer's brain. So, we're going to talk about two sorts of paintings. Many of you will know that Frank Pollock uh, dripped, he was known as uh, Jack the Dripper. He dripped paint onto canvases or he sometimes threw paint at canvases. And when we're seeing the result, we're not just seeing some blobs on a canvas, we're feeling a motor, an internal response to the gesture of producing it. Similarly, there was this uh, series of works by the artist uh, uh, Luciano F uh, Fontana. Now, Fontana had these canvases that he slashed with a knife, okay? And what uh, Umlita and, and Galesi did was they had subjects wired up with EEG, it was an EEG experiment, and they were shown Fontana, and then they were shown computer-generated light and dark patches that correspond to exactly the light and dark shade. And it's only when they're looking at a Fontana that their supplementary motor area and premotor area are active. So they're responding to this not as a visual object alone, but as an action or the result of an action. That's actually what's being engaged. So here's another colleague in London, Chris McManus. He talks about our ability to empathize with objects. We don't just empathize with people, but we empathize with objects. And he says, uh, Heinrich Wolflin, who had a wonderful book, The Psychology of Architecture, in, in 1886, Heinrich Wolflin suggested that aesthetic preferences for golden section rectangles described by Fechner resulted from empathetic embodied response, responses to gravity, making tall, thin rectangles unstable, but elegant, and squares heavy and bulky, and wide, flat rectangles relaxed and dissipated. So the idea here is, when you look at a building and it's got lovely, thin, elegant columns, you can feel its lightness and elegance because you know what it's like to bear weight. You know what it's like to be embodied. When you see a thick column, a heavy, thick column, it looks heavy, bulky, because you know what it's like to take weight on your shoulders. You're using your own body to understand the physics of the objects in the, the spaces around you, and that's part of responding to objects. McManus thought Wolflin was nearly right, but not quite. So McManus does some beautiful, beautiful experiments uh, to show, again, commonalities that we all have universally in our responses to art. In one uh, beautiful experiment, he's got, um, he's got a, a photograph, black and white photograph. It's of the, from the Tate Modern, Tate Modern Gallery looking across the Thames at uh, St. Paul's Cathedral and there's some trees, and there's a path, and there's a figure. And what you're then invited to do is you're invited to crop that photograph. You can only choose a small section of the photograph. And you've got this device that blacks out everything else, and you can move around, and you can choose where do I take the best photograph. And of course, Fechner thought that what gives us our ability to respond to works of art is being able to know how to produce them. 
But most of us are not artists. But McManus worked out that, well, we kind of are these days because we take out our phones and we try to figure out what's the perfect shot, what's the, the best shot I can get. And so with this experiment, you've got a photograph, you have to choose some part of it, everything else blacked out around it, and you move around till you find what you think is, yeah, that's best. Now you can't get the tower in and the person, you can't get the trees and the, and the, the dome, you've got to choose. But what's really interesting is that when you look at the dots at the center of people's chosen selection, they congregate massively. In other words, a lot of agreement about what people think is the best selection they can make of that framing of a photograph. And he, did, he repeated the experiment in China, same. And then even better, once you get all the agreement, he then shows everyone in the experiment what people have selected, and then they choose of those ones which are the best, and there's even more agreement about that's, that's really the best one. Very interesting. When I looked at the raw data, though, he shows you the data, and there are a couple which are right up in the top corner, and you think, what's that? And he said, those are art students. We just threw them out. <laughs> they're, just, they're just trying to do something crazy. Okay, but if you're looking at how people n usually frame a photograph, he also did another experiment um, in Holland, Mondrian. So you know Mondrian paintings, they're just sort of uh, horizontal and vertical lines and colored blocks. And he found some Mondrians that are hardly ever shown to the public, so that we're not familiar with them already. They're very rarely exhibited. And he made digital copies of them, and then he, he produced an app where what you can do is you can change the lines you can move them closer together or further apart. You can move some of the horizontal lines up and down, some of the vertical lines side to side. And he sets them in random positions and asks people, move them until you think that's just right. And there's huge overlap between the ones that people choose and the actual Mondrians. So why Mondrian was so successful was that he was sort of tapping into what people would feel was the natural way to assemble those. Very, very interesting. Okay. So, we're exploring how other senses modify viewing, and this is what we do uh, in some of our work at the Center for the Study of the Senses in University of London. We're interested in how many senses we use to experience the world. People say five. How do we, how do the senses interact to shape our experiences? And how do multi-sensory processes shape our sensibilities and appreciation of artworks? So um, this is the first place to start. When you ask people how many senses they've got, almost all over the world they say five. Why five? Why five? That's crazy. If you ask neuroscientists these days, they'll say anywhere between 22 and 33. Got lots more senses than that. So just think of some of the senses you have. Proprioception. If you close your eyes now, you know where your limbs are, you, can, you know where your hands are, your feet are, where your arms and legs, without having to look at them or touch them. You just know. That's another sense. Your sense of balance. You know whether you're tilting sideways or backwards or up and down. It's another sense. Many, many, many more senses than five. But not only that, we also know that the senses interact. They affect each other. They sometimes fuse, but they, they often affect each other's working. And we know some of the principles behind this. So multisensory integration, where your senses or the input from your senses comes together, that often gives us very useful insights into the, the mechanisms here, because we've got rules of combining the senses. Sensory dominance, where one sense dominates another. Sensory uh, uh, spatiotemporal unity, where the information comes from the same place at the same time. And then semantic congruence, when we think these are sensory pieces of information that go together quite naturally. So here's a case of sensory dominance, the ventriloquism effect. So when you're in the cinema, when you're at the movies, it looks as though the voices are coming out of the actor's mouths on the screen. They can't be, it's a screen, right? Even Steve Jobs couldn't do that. 
That's a screen. So where is the sound coming from? Well, the sound's often coming from the side of the movie theater, behind you, or under your seat. And what the brain is doing is saying, well, look, since the visual information tells me the mouth that's, that's making speech sounds at the right time is there, you simply auditorily relocate your, your auditory attention, and it's as if you hear the sound is coming from there. This is called visual capture of auditory attention. Okay? So this is a way in which vision dominates audition. You don't say, hang on, the sound is coming from here. You take the sound to be where the visual information is. But vision doesn't always win. Vision doesn't always win. Here's my favorite example of how vision gets interfered with or how another sense can lead vision. So the next time you're on a plane, you get on, you sit down, you strap in, and they give you the instruction. There are two doors at the rear and two over the wing and two at the front. And in the unlikely event, you'll find, you know, under your seat, et cetera, et cetera. Look around the cabin. Look around the cabin. See where everything is. See where everyone is. See where everything is. Look, at, look in the cabin. Now you take off. And now you're in the climb. And the aircraft is climbing at this angle. Now look again at the front of the cabin. Now it will look to you as though the front of the cabin is higher than you are. But how can it? Because you're in exactly the same visual relationship to everything in the cabin, optically, as you were when you were on the ground. Nothing has changed. The cabin hasn't gone up here. The cabin is still in the same visual relation. So how can it look? How can it look as though the cabin is higher? And the answer is, of course, the vestibular system, the canals in your ears of, of the fluid are telling you you're tilting back. And that's influencing what you see and changing what you see. So here, what you're seeing is not created by vision alone. It's created by vision and by your ears, by the vestibular system. And of course, I talked earlier to, to people here, Taste and smell is another case where we have an integration or an influence of one on another. So what is tasting? Boy, we miss that guy, don't we? We miss that guy. <laughs> Tears. Um, okay, well, since we're able to do experiments now, we know that tasting is not just done with the tongue and that we're not getting all the flavors from the tongue. We're actually getting flavors mainly from the nose. So all the tongue gives you is salt, sweet, sour, bitter, savory, umami. But you can taste peach, mango, melon, pineapple. You don't have pineapple receptors on your tongue. That's all coming from smell. But it's coming from this secondary sense of smell. So we think of smell as molecules going into the nose when you breathe in, but there are also molecules traveling to the nose from the mouth when you're chewing, and when you swallow, when you swallow, um, that pulses odors up to the nose, and that's when you get a big hit of flavor. So what we think of as taste is actually a, a fusion of these two senses, taste and smell, and they get integrated here in the orbital frontal cortex. And of course, we confuse taste and smell when we have vanilla. I used this example before, but vanilla, baunilla, it's, it smells sweet, but it isn't sweet. If you eat a little bit of a vanilla pod, it's bitter. There's no sweetness. Ugh. So why is it sweet? Because we combine it with things that are sweet, with sugar in ice cream, in chocolate. So this is actually a fantastic piece of construction by the brain. When you taste vanilla ice cream, you've got the smell of vanilla, something that isn't sweet. You're getting sugar, which is sweet, and together they give you the flavor of vanilla, which you think of as a sweet flavor. For cultures, for cultures in um, Southeast Asian, Southeast Asian cuisines, if they never use vanilla with sweet food, and they only use vanilla, baunilla, with salty food, when they smell uh, baunilla, they'll say it smells salty. It's an association of the brain. It's not in the, the food. So we know that flavor is multisensory. 
Flavor is a way of putting together information, not just from smell and taste, but from touch. Is something crispy or chewy or oily, okay? We're using that information too. The temperature, when something is cold, when something is fizzy, when you have a can of Coca-Cola and you, you drink it, you feel the bubbles bursting on your tongue. And those bubbles, full of CO2, they have an effect on not smell, not taste, but on the trigeminal nerve. That's the nerve that serves the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. And that's the one that hurts when you have too much wasabi. When you have too much wasabi, you feel it there. Ah, bridge of the nose, right? So those CO2 bubbles in, in Coke, they go up to the nose and they stun you a little bit. If you drink too quickly, you'll feel the same pain in the, in the nose. CO2, trigeminal stimulation, suppresses sweetness and accentuates sourness. That's one of the effects it has. Also, when you have something at ice cold temperature, you reduce sweetness and bitterness. Oh, sorry, you accentuate bitterness and you accentuate sourness. If you warm it up, it'll taste sweeter. This is why if you try to drink Coca-Cola when it's flat and when it's warm, it's disgusting. It's really unpalatable because it's got seven spoonfuls of sugar. That's the amount of sugar it has in a can. And you can't drink it, but if it's ice cold and it's got CO2, it bluffs the brain to allow you to ingest way more sugar than you should have. And then you think, the brain thinks, mmm, give me more sugar, and you start drinking more and more of it. It's a very bad thing. Clever, but bad. Now, I want to look at the aesthetics of food finally, because it's often said that we eat first with our eyes, that we look at something and we decide, ooh, that looks delicious. Now, how can it look delicious? Delicious is how it tastes, but you say, that looks delicious. When you go to the canteen and you've got the plates in front of you, you say, ooh, I think I'll have that. You're using your eyes to predict and ex expect some experience in the mouth, okay? But also, we eat first with the eyes, and we eat secondly with our fingers. We eat with our fingers. And here's a really strange thing. We now know, experiments that Charles Spence, my uh, friend and collaborator in University of Oxford has done, that when you are eating, say, ice cream, if you eat ice cream and you stroke velvet, the ice cream is very smooth, very creamy. But if you now stroke Velcro, it's very rough. The ice cream seems coarse, not as smooth. So what you're touching with your fingers can affect the way the brain processes what you're experiencing on your tongue. Now, I think the only way to explain that is to suppose that your fingertips are very sensitive, so is your tongue, very, very sensitive receptors. And when you touch something, it's the first expectation about what it's going to feel like when you put that in your mouth. And children do that all the time. Babies pick things up, put them to the mouth, okay? So you're learning to expect certain sensations from the fingers to the mouth. So when you change what the fingers are getting, the mouth just seems to already be biased into making a change in how things taste. But also, how we describe things matters as well. So this is a chef that uh, I work with, Heston Blumenthal in, in the UK. And he points out that when he had a dish and it was called crab ice cream, okay? Crab fish ice cream. People thought, ah, no, I don't want to eat it. But when he changed it to frozen crab bisque or frozen savory mousse, oh, that's lovely. So, so the words, the expectation that's set in the brain is making a difference to how you'll perceive things. Here's another lovely experiment by Charles Spence. He won a prize, the Ig Nobel Prize, not the Nobel Prize, the Ig Nobel Prize for this piece of work. If you take Pringles, you know Pringles? If you take Pringles and you leave them outside the box for a day, you taste them and they're not fresh, they're sort of soft, they're not nice, and you say they taste stale. Blech. And we don't like that, even though 
the taste and smell is about the same. If you, if you rolled them up, they would be about the same in the mouth, whether they were fresh or stale. But when they are out of the box, the fact that they break differently, the fact their texture changes, predicts decay. And the brain doesn't like that. It predicts that you're going to get something that goes rotten. So you have these Pringles. They've been outside the box for a day. And now you put headphones on and you amplify the high frequency sound of someone's crunching and now they taste fresh. Amazing, you can try this and you, you try them and it's just like, that's great. So should we say that flavor is also auditory? Is it, is it auditory flavor? Here's a paper that uh, Charles and I and a chef, Charles Michel wrote. When you're on an airplane and people always say the food on an airplane is horrible, it's terrible. They work really hard, some of the airlines, to make the food better. But they're up against all sorts of things. The air is dry and cold. Not as many molecules come to the nose. You're at high altitude, low pressure, so the molecules are not diffuse. But there's another factor. White noise in your ears. White noise in the ears. 70, 79 decibels and above. Aircraft cabin noise affects the brain's ability to perceive salt, sweet, and sour from the tongue and can lower it to about 10 or 15% lower. So white noise has this effect. But there's one of the basic tastes that's immune to this effect that isn't affected by noise, and that is umami, the fifth taste, the taste that the Japanese discovered. Now, what has got plenty of umami that you can have on a flight? And the answer is tomatoes. What do people drink on a flight and at no other time? They drink lots of tomato juice. Oh, yes, I'll have tomato juice. I'll have a Bloody Mary. Loads of people do that. You say, do you usually drink tomato juice? No, horrible. But it turns out to be better on a flight. It really is better. So you should always drink tomato juice on a flight. The cabin crew will hate you. They try to lock it away, but it's good. Do that. Now, as well as responding to the world visually, auditorily, by touch, as I said, you've also got the inside and the outside. So from the outside, you hear, you see, you touch, but you've also got the inside, and that's not just the brain, but it's the brain and the body, and in particular, the heart. That has an effect. Every time your heart beats, it sends a signal to your brain, and your brain records what's going on in your heart. In fact, the brain has got um, representation of each of your visceral organs, the slow waves of the stomach, the fast beating of the heart. Everything that's changing inside you is monitored by the brain. The brain's paying attention to that. And that can change how you experience emotions and how you experience uh, perception as well. So this is important. And emotions are expressed in the body and the brain in different ways. This is heat maps of where people feel emotions. They might feel it in the stomach, they might feel it in the face, they might feel it in the body. You see differences in people's blood pressure when they're having different emotions. You also see different neural architecture for different emotions. And eye pupil. When your pupil goes very small, that indicates sadness. When the pupil shrinks, that indicates sadness. And what's very interesting is if you're an empathetic person and you're listening to or talking to someone else who is sad, your pupil shrinks as well. And your pupil shrinks so that it matches or mirrors what somebody else is feeling. And this is a way that maybe you feel the emotion that someone else is expressing and a way that you connect, a way that you can have empathy. So how does this work? Well, this is the work of Hugo Critchley and Sarah Garfinkel in University of Sussex. So whenever the heart pulses, boom, that means you get a, a pressure on the valves. The blood goes into the valves and expands them. And you have these baroreceptors, and they, they register to the brain that the brain is firing. And you've got different parts of the cycle. You've got the point where the, the heart pulses, and you've got the gaps in between where it's silent. 
and different information is carried and different things happen and are processed when you're processing either um, at the heartbeat or off the heartbeat. So if you're processing fear signals, if you're processing fear signals, you actually recognize fear quicker and more intensely if the fear stimuli are presented to you on the heartbeat at systole. If you're given them at systole, they're much more alarming. But if you're trying to do a tricky perceptual judgment, you're much, much worse at systole when the heart is beating than you are judging between heartbeats. Okay. So that means that you've got to pay attention also to your internal state as well as your external state, the emotional state that you're in. And earlier we saw how you can measure that. Some people are very good. Some people are very good at knowing what emotions they're having because they're very aware of their, not because they're aware, because they're accurate in responding to their heartbeats. And other people are not. So, um, yeah. So, what does the heart know? Turns out that the heart is often going to get information from the eye, from the amygdala, and that will speed up your reaction. You'll have an emotional reaction, and the heart will beat faster. And that information will go to the brain and it will bypass some of the slow processing that we do so that you can get information that gives you a very quick uptake on what's going on around you if you're able to tune into those signals, if you're able to use that channel between the heart and the brain. Turns out if you want to remember things, memory tasks are better if you try to remember between heartbeats. So if you're, if you're mem remembering words, you're actually better at diastole between heartbeats than you are at systole. Okay. Now this interoceptive channel is altered in the case of anxiety. So fear, processes, fear processing is not, is not done well when you're uh, getting information at systole, if you've got anxiety, you're too aroused. You don't get the change between normal and aroused. And that, that alteration is actually quite bad. So some key findings here. Your internal states, your internal senses matter for emotion. And if you're responding to works of art emotionally as well, this matters. Emotion is embodied, it's felt in the body. The emotions of others can be represented in the brain and the body of yourself. Individuals with impaired emotion recognition in self and others may have a deficit. People who are not good at reading the emotions of others, it might be because they're not good at reading these changes in themselves. The heart and the brain are dynamically coupled. The interoceptive channel can be accessed through cardiac timing. This interoceptive channel is implicated in fear processing, it's altered with anxiety, but there's a potential for helping people to change anxiety by changing that bodily signal. This is all the work of Sarah Garfinkel and Hugo Critchley. Okay, so, both emotional faces and words can induce physiological signatures of emotion in the brain and the body. The mirroring of emotional states can underscore embodiment of empathy but there'll be individual differences that can influence the physical change and the effects on cognition. But all of this, all of this is important when it comes to processing works of art as well. So the internal milieu as well as the external milieu makes a difference. Here's a paper, a recent paper, uh, eLife by Mika Allen and colleagues. Unexpected arousal, something strange and unexpectedly arousing, can influence the sensory noise on how confident you are about your reactions or judgments. Here's Mika Allen. Our results suggest that subtle, unconscious changes in the physiological states of our body impact on how we perceive. So if we artificially increase arousal, increase people's heart rates, it actually caused participants to act as if they were blind to the quality of their visual experiences. They start ignoring things in the external world because they're paying too much attention to what's going on on the internal world. So arousal is modulated in this way. And Geraint Rees, who's also on the paper, says, as disorders such as depression and anxiety can be linked to altered states of arousal, 
our findings raise the possibility that patients suffering from these conditions might perceive an unrealistically certain or an unrealistically uncertain world. So how you engage with the world around you, how you engage in particular with works of art, depends not just on your individual senses, but how they affect one another, how they fuse together, how you're affected by the context in which you're perceiving the work of art externally, but also the internal context, the state you're in, the emotions you're able to read, the physiological changes in you, all of that matters, and that's all part of the multi-sensory responses to works of art. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Barry. Uh, so we, we have a time, not, not uh, just a few time, we have some time for discussion and anyone who wants to, answer, to, to make a question can do it now. And we, we the, the purpose is to have a dialogue with, with Barry so that uh, he can answer your questions and then you can reply if you want, okay? If someone wants some help in translation, there, there are some people here that can help in translation, questions from Portuguese to English, so we can do that also. Yeah. So questions yeah. or reactions or thoughts, <laughs> whatever you yes. whatever you like. Okay. Also, uh, uh, vocês podem perguntar em português e tem alguns aqui que podem ajudar a traduzir para o inglês. Então vocês podem fazer perguntas de esclarecimento, uh, exclamações. Ele está dizendo. Né? Uh, uh, questões que ficaram, uh, dúvidas que ficaram. Uh, a ideia é fazer um diálogo franco e aberto e, enfim, com o Barry aqui. Nós estamos num momento informal, sabe? De, a ideia é realmente de nós tentarmos esclarecer algumas dúvidas que nós temos sobre teoria da percepção com o Barry. O Barry... Eu, Sorry, Barry. Okay. Uh, o Barry trouxe aqui muitas informações sobre, multi, sobre, na verdade, novas ideias e teorias acerca da multissensorialidade, né? da nossa capacidade de combinar é, múltiplas informações de diferentes, é, digamos, sistemas sensórios ou sistemas perceptivos que, que na verdade, estão sendo descobertos. Né? Ele, a certa altura, disse que nós, hoje os teóricos oscilam entre dizer que nós temos 22 ou 32 né, é, 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 possibilidades de sensações, né, de sistemas sensórios. Né? E, por outro lado, nós podemos combiná-los. Então, na verdade, isso assim, é, acaba... É, criando percepções de uma forma exponencial, no sentido de variações perceptivas né, exponencialmente diversas. Né? E, e a, o tema é de que, na, na, durante a, a, a nossa visão de obras de arte, essa multissensorialidade é utilizada, né? Exactly. <laughs> sorry, Barry, sorry. Disculpa, não falo português. Sorry, Barry, I wanted to... Uh, okay. And so... I have a question. Uh, uh, you, you spoke at some point about cross-modality, and this is... Uh, 
and the difference between cross-modality and combining sensations. So could you speak a little bit more about that? Uh, what would be the difference if, between combining sensory information and yeah. cross-modality? So I think cross-modality is where information in one sense affects, has an impact on what happens in the other sense, but it's still another sense. So in the case of smelling vanilla, you smell something sweet, and that makes what you're tasting taste sweeter. So it's still a sweet taste. It's still that sense that's active. Similarly, um, when you uh, hear um, certain sounds, so for example, if you rub your hands together, you feel how your hands feel. Now we play you the sound of as you do that. Now your hands feel rough and coarse. This is information from the ears having an impact on what you feel with the hands. That's just cross-modal effects. But multisensory integration is where you can't pull apart the information. So uh, take the example of the airline. Here, you think it's just sight, but it's not. You couldn't have that experience of it looking as though the plane the front of the plane was higher than you. You couldn't have that without the combining, the, the merging of the experiences so that you've got information about tipping back, feeling that, and information about seeing, and it makes a unified percept. It makes a unified perception where you can't cut it up into the two parts. With the, with the fingers, you can know what you're hearing, and you can know what you're feeling, and you see there are two things. What you don't realize is how much what you're hearing is affecting what you feel, but they don't merge. You can still see two, th two senses at work. Here you can't separate it out. And I think also with flavor, when you're eating uh, some pineapple, abakashi, or you're drinking abakashi calm orela, Ortela. Ortela. No, still not doing it right. Ortela. Ortela. Okay, good. Oof. So when you're having those, you just experience a single flavor. That's the flavor. You can't see which is coming from the nose and which is coming from the tongue. They're fused. That's multisensory integration, I think. So these are, that's how I'd separate the two. se fundem, se fundem, merge, é, elas se fundem de forma que eu não consigo mais distinguir entre um, uma informação de um sentido e de um outro. E, na verdade... Ah, pois é. Isso é... é Pin apple juice a merge or a cross modality? It's a merge. It's, it's a, a merge. merge. Ah, exatamente. The, yeah, it's a way in which you can't tell which is coming from the tongue and which is coming from the nose. The only way you can tell is if you block the nose and now you drink, you'll get, you won't identify it as pineapple. You'll know it's sweet but you won't know it's pineapple. It's only when the nose is involved. But once you let the nose in, now it's a single thing, and you can no longer say this bit from the tongue, this bit from the nose. So that's multisensory integration. É uma fusão, uma fusão. Quando você toma um suco com hortelã, você funde, mas não na verdade não é o sabor da hortelã com o sabor do, da, da, do abacaxi, mas é a, o, o sentido do paladar com o sentido do olfato. Aí você tem uma uma experiência multisensorial, multisensorial, uma fusão.
so he's asking uh, about your description of the wine experience, yeah. uh, about the multiple aspects of the experience, multiple sensory aspects of the wine experience. So, so, so many people, if you give them a glass of wine to drink and you say, tell me what you think of this wine, this is what they do. They pick it up, they go, I like it or I don't like it. That's what they tell you. And you say, no, no, I'm not asking about you. Tell me about the wine. And they say, hmm, I don't know. It's as if the whole point of drinking was to give you thumbs up or thumbs down. It's just that was it. Which is very strange because you're supposed to pay attention to what's happening, but that's very difficult to do because it happens so quickly. Something comes into the mouth, you swallow, it's gone. And what people who uh, are kind of conscious wine tasters try to do, they try to slow down the process. They try to think what's happening at every stage because tasting, tasting wine is not a single event. It's a sequence of events. Something happens and then something else happens after that and then something else happens. So as the mouth enters, as, sorry, as the wine enters the mouth, the attack of the wine, you feel the sweetness of the fruit and then as it travels across the palate, you can feel the texture. Is it soft? Is it silky? Is it rough? Is it coarse? You can feel that. And then you start to taste the acids. The acidity builds up. You start to tell whether it's bitter as you swallow. You then get the lingering aftertaste. Is it, is it persistent? Does that, that, that aroma last? Now, that's why wine, wine uh, professionals break it up into the, the attack at the beginning, the mid-palate just before you swallow, and then the finish when you swallow and what happens next. And they think of these three sequences. And very often when you're starting, you can think of the beginning, you can think of the end, but the difficult thing is to experience what happens in the middle. And that matters because with a wine like Chianti from Italy, you get the sweetness of the fruit and you get something in the middle and then you get bitterness at the end. But with a wine like Chinon uh, from the Loire, you, you get um, sweetness, bitterness in the middle, and then sweetness in the finish. So the sequence is different, although they're quite similar. So once you're able to identify these stages, you're able to analyze wines, you're able to break them up. But here's the problem with that. When you teach people to taste wines analytically, you get them to concentrate just on one thing. Concentrate just on the acidity. How sour is the wine? What's the acidity? So you taste this wine, taste this wine, taste this wine. Put them in order, which is the most acid, which is the least acid. And they can do that. And then you say to them, did you enjoy any of those wines? They say, I don't know. And you say, okay, forget that now. Just drink as you would at home. And they go, oh, that's quite nice. Or, oh, I don't like that. So it's as if the properties of liking attach to the whole. Whereas when you taste analytically, you focus on one thing, pay attention to that, and it stops you from attending to the other parts. And maybe what it is to be a wine expert is when you can recognize the parts and recognize the whole, when you can have both of those together. Just as it's the same with music. When you first, as a child, when you first hear an orchestra, it's just a sound, it's a big sound. And then you have to pay attention to the strings and the brass and the wind instruments. And when you pay attention to them, you stop hearing the whole thing. When you're able to hear them all and hear the whole as made up of these parts and to be able to notice the parts and how they contribute to the whole, then you've got a much richer experience. So it's not surprising that people who are new to wine, they get liking first because they do the whole. They're not good at looking at the parts. You teach them to look at the parts and then they've got to make their way back to assembling the whole. That's, that's what I think is going on in tasting. Deu para compreender 
que a experiência do, do vinho é um processo com várias partes, né? É, e e eu, uma questão importante é que algumas partes, não sei, aí depois eu vou perguntar para o Berto se eu estou certa, são mais multissensoriais que outras, né? E a experiência completa ela pode ser multissensorial, mas a experiência do provador, às vezes, é analítica. Ou seja, o, 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 o expert, né, o sommelier, ele pode decompor a, a experiência. Uh, I have a question about that, because is there, in this process, at some point, um, do you have an unisensorial experience? Yes, I think you can have uh, a, a unisensory experience that's complex and a unisensory uh, experience that's just unified where you're not able to pay attention to the parts. Mm. But even then, even then, notice you can't pay attention to the parts. You can't say this is the tongue, this is the, the nose. Uh, you can pay attention to the the order in which things happen. Now, now, now. Uh, But that's not the same as breaking it into the sensory parts. But look, when you're trying to do analytic wine tasting, you're trying to unpick the work that the brain does effortlessly. <laughs> It's a really hard thing to do. The brain has done all this wonderful work of putting it all together. And what you're trying to do is break it all apart into its pieces. That's really hard. That's really hard. Não, é, é, então, é, é isso mesmo. Onde é que está o... Saiu <risos> o Natan. <risos> okay. é, não, é que realmente o, o, o sommelier, ele consegue decompor a experiência multissensorial em partes que são unissensoriais. Né? Às vezes, o, o sentido mais do, do aroma, às vezes, mais da, da, do paladar. Então, ele tenta realmente fazer essa decomposição. Uh, yeah, the question is, how do you do it? <laughs> It's very hard. So, so I think partly how you do it. The most difficult thing you do is the thing that you do all the time. Someone gives you a single glass of wine and says, what do you experience? And you taste it. I don't know, I mean, compared to what? But if I give you two glasses of wine, side by side, try that one, try this one, are they the same or different? They're different. Which do you prefer? I like that one on the, on the right. Why, what's the difference? Now you start noticing this one is oilier, or this one is sweeter, or this one has got an aftertaste, or you now notice the difference by comparison. So actually, the brain is better at doing comparisons than it is at doing single judgment. So when you're trying to find out what's happening in a wine, don't get people to drink a single glass. Compare. Always taste two different things. See what the differences are. Notice the difference. We're much better at discriminating, much better than identifying what's happening in a single wine. So I think that's the, that's the way in. That's the start. But, but there are questions. I mean, When I'm trying to get people to pay attention to wines, there are some questions. You can say, here's a red wine, okay. Does it taste of red fruits or black fruits? And you can think of that. You can think, is it more strawberry or cherry or is it more like black currants or is it more like, you know, uh, blackberries? You can say, is the texture more like velvet or silk or satin? And your tongue is good. You, even though you never taste satin or silk or velvet, your tongue knows just because your fingers know how to do that differentiation. When you have a white wine and you taste the white wine, is the acid, is it more like lemon or is it more like lime? And you can do those distinctions. And when you start paying attention, you will start noticing things that stand out. So it's all about comparison, I think. É, 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 só deu para compreender comparação e distinção na verdade para ensinar uma pessoa a provar um vinho é, comparando 
compara a acidez do vinho com limão, compara um vinho com outro. Então, ao comparar, você distingue também, na verdade, essas propriedades como acidez, é, aveludo, como é que é? Aveluda. São... É, na verdade... Uh, you, you describe wine with the same words as the, the origin use. Yes. For yes. example, velvet. Yes. Yeah. You don't have another word. No. You use the same word. Yeah, you use the same word. Okay. But the, the, the Aveludado other, is the same word for wine. The, the other thing that's interesting, this business of discrimination rather than identifying, people say, What do you taste in that wine? Ah, I don't know. It turns out that as we get older, as you get older, your sense of smell drops and you're less able to identify certain aromas. But your identification goes down, but your discrimination is still there. You can tell two odors apart, even if you're no longer good at identifying them. You can tell them apart. And it also suggests that discrimination comes first, and that identifying, as opposed to discriminating, is actually higher cognitive and probably tied up with language. And we lose our language as we get older as well. We lose the names for things. So discrimination is the best way in the senses, in the brain, to lock on to what's actually happening. Always do discrimination. Can you identify the a colheita, uh, the year of the wine, or when it was made? Some people can. I've done it once or twice. Um, so, 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 what helps is um, as the wine ages, all sorts of wine's a living thing. It's a living object. It changes and it changes in, in predictable ways. So the acids soften, the tannins, the structure softens. The color changes. Instead of looking bright purple, it looks slightly red and brown around the edge if you look at it. The smell changes. It smells like something old and not something fresh and new. So, You need to have lots and lots and lots and lots of experience of tasting the same wine, young and old, young and old. So the people who are really good at this are the winemakers and the families of the winemakers. They're really good at it. So, so there was a winemaker in Burgundy, there is a winemaker in Burgundy called Nicolas Potel, and his uh, father died when he was a young man, and he had to take up making the wines in the estate. And, and because his mother was suffering, she was missing her husband, he thought it would be very nice to take her to visit all of his father's friends, other winemakers. And every time they visited someone, the winemakers would bring out a very special bottle and they'd open it. And every time they did, she would say, ah, that's the 1981, or ah, that's the 1977, <laughs> or oh, That's, and, and they began to get a little annoyed. So they'd say, hmm. And they would go back into the cellar and they'd pull out a bottle. What's this? And she'd say, oh, that's 1976. <laughs> and Nicola said he'd never seen his mother do this. And he asked, how do, how do you do that? And she said, when my father was making wine and I was a little girl, he would take me with him And the men would all sit and taste, and they would think, well, we better give the child a glass. And she would sit there listening to the men discuss. She would just sip this wine. And somehow that made such a memory for her. And as she tasted those wines later, 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 
She knew exactly how to distinguish one from another. She, she didn't have some special range of knowledge. She had experience and memory. She had a very good memory and she had very good experience. And your experiences as a child are very significant. And she remembers sitting there with her father quietly as the men discussed the wine. She just sipped it. She was probably nine or ten. That's when they start drinking in France. So that's an interesting case of people who really can. But, but I've, talked to, I've talked to many tasters who can identify wines blind. You know, they're given a wine. What is this? This is a wine from um, Bordeaux, from the Medoc. It's a 1982, la, 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 la. And I say to them, how do you do it? And they say, it's, it's experiential, mem episodic memory. They taste it. And they think, have I tasted that before? And they, they search. And then they say, ah, yes, I remember. And now that they know, they say for the audience, they put on a pantomime, some theater. This is a wine, I think, from France. I think it's from Bordeaux. It's probably from you know, the Medoc. It's probably a very hot year. And they do all of that. But they either know it or they don't. So an awful lot is to do with memory. But how we know if a wine is old or young, what year it is, is often because we've tasted it before and we've tasted it young and old. And that's gone in. That's how we do it, I think. Deu para completar. Não, na verdade, o que ele está dizendo é que há uma memória de um vinho particular, a pessoa consegue memorizar. É muito difícil determinar, tomando um vinho, se ele é jovem ou mais velho, ou de onde é, ou quando foi colhido. Mas, se a pessoa já experimentou o mesmo vinho antes e sabe o ano, ela pode reconhecê-lo, como o caso da, 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 da menina, quer dizer, da senhora que ele conheceu, que foi criada numa... Num, enfim, uma, uma vinícola, né? e que desde os nove anos experimentava vinho. E ela sabia todos os vinhos, de, né? ela sabia o ano de todos os vinhos. Mas por quê? Porque ela havia experimentado cada um deles antes e memorizou. Né? Então, na verdade, é, você reconhece o vinho. Né? Ou talvez um vinho semelhante. Na verdade, ele está cético em relação a você poder adivinhar. Eu diria, it's not very optimistic. Your... No, it's just, just I, I, I wanted to ask you because I, I, I want to understand. It's a recognition, but not a, a identification. Yeah. Eu vou, tu quer falar? Agora? <laughs> no, I'm still stuck in multisensory and cross model. Uh, I couldn't get the point okay. of, of the difference and what is the difference for because in the experience you uh, taught us, I can of course discriminate between grabbing the microphone. And, and, and hearing, I, I can separate that, and so. Okay, but look, you, you can hear this sound, and you can feel in your hands. What you don't know until you try that, you don't know that the sound affects how things feel. If you hadn't rubbed your hands together, if you just hear the sound and now rub your hands together, you think, oh, my hands are very dry, they're very rough. You won't know, you'll know I'm hearing something and I'm feeling something. What you won't know is the cross-modal effect of one sense on another. What's happening in hearing is changing how things feel, but there's still different senses. And one of the senses is changing what's felt in another sense, right? It's not the same in the airplane. It's not. One sense, which is yeah. in your ear, yeah. is changing what you are... Yes, but you can't, in experience, you can't recognize it as two senses. 
In fact, we always make that mistake. You say, in the plane, you think, I'm just seeing it. It's just vision. You're wrong about that. Because you can't break it apart into this bit's vision, this bit's to do with my vestibular system. You can't parse it into those two things. It's just They're a cognitive fused. thing because I, although I know that I have two experiences, this and, yeah. and this, I cannot, do I can separate them in the sense that now I know that the, this uh, noise is influencing my okay. touching experience, I can separate both? Now look, you can separate them in the, the parchment effect, right? Cross-modal effects are where you're experiencing in two senses, and what's happening in one sense is affecting what you experience in another sense. But you don't necessarily recognize how one is affecting the other, but you know you've got two different senses. And that's not such uh, a change. That's not such a change from the common sense way of thinking. But multi-sensory experiences where there's integration of information are cases where you don't realize that what you're actually experiencing is a fusion of, of two senses. senses. You think it's just one. You think it's just vision. There's also the McGurk so it's, effect. It's, it's about my recognition of my experience. It's something, yeah. uh, the, the difference is on well, my cognition of that. Well, it's no, because it's also a difference in how they're processed. In one case, you've got these two parallel sensory systems. And what's happening here is having an effect on what's happening there. In the other case, these are contributing to produce a third thing, mm -hmm. which is neither. One of the other. Yeah. That's multisensory fusion. So it's very much about that. It's very much about, and even at the level of the brain, you're probably producing something which you cannot, which is a third set of neurons that's not parsed into one or the other. It's and not just smell, it's not just sight, it's not just sight, it's not just, it's, this, it's another representation that's drawing information from both and making a third thing. My intuition is that the majority of our experiences would be multisensory rather than cross-model. Yes, yes, but right, but, but look, what's very interesting is when we think about our experiences, we think that they're multisensory in the sense that we're having experiences with many senses going on at once. But what we don't realize is that some of the ones that we think are unisensory are, in fact, not unisensory. Mm -hmm. They're a combination. Mm -hmm. That's the crucial thing. Yes, and that's, that's why the majority of our experiences must be yes. multisensory, yes. yes. because our brain is... Yes, okay. yeah. Thank you. Well, Barry, thank you for the talk. Really amazing, a lot of... Thank you new information, at least for me. But I, uh, I would like to, to move to another topic. Uh, could you please put the, the, the McManus stuff yes. on display? Yeah, yeah. okay. Well, I, I'm, I'm a little skeptical about this ability to empathize with object, because what, what could be the, the biological function of this ability of capacity, because I, I know what, what is the, <laughs> the biological function to empathize with another people or characters in the fiction, but with objects. What could be the, the, okay. the biological function of so, that? So two possibilities. It might be a spandrel. It might be just some side effect of the fact that we identify with animate objects that, that, that we can't help carrying that over. That might, that, it, that we were not built evolutionarily to do this, but it might be just a carryover. The other thing, the other thing is, it might be that when you look at objects, you already know what it's going to be like to lift them or move them. You know where they're going to balance. You know where they're going to fall. You know if they're, I know if I put this like, now these are attached, yeah. I know if I, 
put this down here, it's not going to be stable, right? It's going to drop. But if I put it there, it's okay. And I know if it's full of water, how I must use it to, to lift it up. And it's probably because you're already converting information from vision into sequences of motor action that you think, how is this stable? Is it light? Is it flexible? Is it movable? Is it too heavy? I think that might be that might be the answer. There's a beautiful demonstration by one of my colleagues, Vincent Hayward, who's an engineer and a neuroscientist, and Vincent does wonderful work. And he's got a, a you pick up a, you pick up a cup, a plastic cup, and it's attached, there's a wire attaching it to your computer. And on the computer screen, you see the cup. And you lift it, and the cup's lifted, you put it down, you shake it, it shakes. And then, on the screen, you see steel, steel balls being poured into the cup, and people do that. <laughs> it's as if, you know, visually they cannot help using their visual information to change how things are physically and motorically for them. So maybe, maybe that's it, and then we just go crazy. We go from small objects to, to big objects that even we are not going to lift or move. We still feel the empathy, we still feel, is it heavy, is it fat, is it light, is it... Probably that. Well, uh, my question is, the following, I heard that the phase of Juven, da, da criança, você gosta do doce. Quando chega a fase adulta, você gosta do meio termo entre o doce e o amargo. E quando você avança na idade, avança na, chega na velhice, você gosta do amargo. A pergunta é, ah, há uma relação entre o gosto eh, e... A, o, as mudanças, as alterações no nosso organismo devido à idade? Ok, então. So, o início da outra pergunta. So, I got sweet and bitter. Ok, the he says, there, the, the, there is a saying that ch children like sweet. Yeah. Uh, mature uh, people like sweet and bitter. Yes. And old people like bitter. Yes. Uh, why? You want to know why? Or, or yeah, yeah, he's, uh, he's asking about the relation. The relation. If, if there is yes. a, a yes. relation between our yes. whole organism and. Yes. So um, it's innate. It's innate that, that children and rats and monkeys uh, like sweet at birth several hours old, if you put a sucrose solution on their lips, they go and you see that in rats and you see it in monkeys and you see it in infants. So we all do that, right? So we like that. Bitter is interesting because most poisons are bitter, most toxins are bitter. Not all, but most toxins are bitter. So again, it's quite useful that to begin with innately when children have something bitter in their mouth, bleh, they spit it out. That's a good protection. But then they have to learn that not everything bitter is going to poison them. And they learn that from seeing the parents eat it, partly. But I think a lot of the really bitter things that we like, we come to like them because of the other effects they have on us. So people don't like alcohol at first. You remember being at an age when you didn't like alcohol. You taste it's too bitter. Ugh. And you remember drinking coffee and you thought, Ugh, or tea. Ugh. But eventually, you try it because the adults try it. So you try it. And of course, with alcohol, we like the post-ingestive effect. We like what happens to us once we've consumed it and then how it makes us feel. It makes us feel relaxed elevates the mood, raises the heart rate a little. It's nice. Similarly, with coffee, 
You drink coffee, it's very bitter, but then you get that slight high as, you, you, as the, the, the neurotransmitters start responding to the caffeine and you start to get, and because you like the effect, the brain then teaches you to like the cause because you like the effect. So you transfer your liking from, I like that effect, so I now start liking the cause. You start, you increase your dopamine levels in response to that bitter taste in coffee and the bitter taste in alcohol. So that's what actually gets you to start liking things even though they were bitter. Does that help? Yeah. Uh, about perception, knowledge and learning, uh, can we combine an environment to improve our learning? Like with the smell and the things. Because if we always percepting the environment with uh, multi-sensory, uh, if we combine things, uh, could be better to learn like Hegel or Kant. It's always better to learn like Hegel and Kant, isn't it? Um, yes, yes, you're right. I mean, in a way, we can't help but learn that way. And we learn, we learn the smell of odors from the objects that have them. We learn the smell of an orange from an orange. We learn the smell of a flower from the flower. And so we are good when we've got the object, we have a smell and, and we've learned it. What we're bad at is when we just get the smell by itself in a little bottle and the orange isn't there and there's nothing orange, there's nothing round, there's nothing that feels this way. And you smell this and you say, oh, what is that? Uh, so that's, you have to learn to do that. And perfumers and winemakers and others have to learn to identify a smell without seeing the object, without touching it. And that's hard. There's a beautiful experiment I just saw. I saw a paper very recently by uh, Terry Acri, who's a very clever sensory scientist. And he was giving people smells, and he was giving them either the silhouette of the shape of a fruit, like the shape of a banana, or the shape of a, an orange, and so on. And then he was giving them just a color, like orange or yellow. And he was seeing, is it the shape? Is it the color? Is it the shape and the color that will help you identify the smell? Very, very nice experiment. And it looks as though we use both bits of information to do it. But you have to learn, and it's very difficult. You, you have to learn when you're smelling a wine and you think, what's that? You've got to kind of have a mental image. And then you think, ah, I know it's cherry. Or, oh, I know it's blackcurrant or it's leather or whatever. So that's hard to do, but you can train yourself to do it, sure. You can train yourself to do everything. But when you're training yourself to do that, again, you're undoing the work of the brain. You're doing something very unnatural. But in a lot of art, you're also doing that. Painters have to learn not just to see, but to change perspectives and dimensions, to know how something appears as opposed to how it is. How does it appear? And of course, when, when painters paint perspective, looking down a street, they don't, they, don't, they don't paint it accurately. They actually paint it um, with a slight exaggeration because that's how our visual system corrects for information about receding lines. So this way in which we try to overcome the way the brain works, this is a very unusual thing to do. It's not what nature it's not what Hegel and Kant were doing, and they were doing other things. It's a funny thing to do, but, but we can teach ourselves to do it, yeah. Uh, could you talk about uh, synesthesia? Because I once uh, heard a guy that's colorblind, and he could see colors from frequency of the yes. context. Yes. So, Synesthesia is interesting because um, not everybody has it. Many more people have it than we thought, but not everybody has it. And people will have those unusual combinations. They hear sounds, they see colors, they uh, think that 
the letter A is red and the letter B is green or whatever. What's interesting is it's idiosyncratic in that not everybody with synesthesia will make the same connections. So somebody might hear the sound of middle C as blue, somebody else hears it as orange, they disagree. They're reliable. You test them now at the age of 10, you test them at 20, you test them at 30, they'll still have the same associations. So we know the associations stick. The theory is that the rest of us naturally prune, we make associations between everything and everything to begin with. And then the brain prunes, it loses those connections because they don't matter. So we keep the ones that we all have in common, but they keep many more. And the question is, why? And we don't know why. We really don't know why. Sometimes there are advantages. The number of people who have synesthesia is highly overlapping with people who are artists or musicians or writers. It's a very high percentage. And so some people think that it's part of creativity and it's in fact, it allows you to be more exploratory in mind. There's a theory by Ramachandran, uh, uh, the neuroscientist, and R Rama thinks that we, have, we make metaphors because of synesthesia. When we say Juliet is the sun, it's a funny thing to say. Sun's a big ball of gas and she's down here and this side, but he thinks that's a little bit of synesthesia, that, that metaphors are synesthesia. So writers, musicians, who are able to hold a whole composition in their head. Mozart famously went in to hear uh, Allegri's Miserere being played in the Vatican, and it was supposed to be sacred music, and it was never supposed to go outside of the Vatican. And he heard it once, and he came out, and he wrote it all down. So he was also synesthetic, and people think, it's hard to just have a, keep a single sense information in your mind, but if you attach it to another sense, to color, that gives it some support. So you've got two things to hold it together, not just sound, but sound and color, and that may improve your memory. So there are various theories about why it's useful, even though we don't all have it. Okay. Uh, yeah. One more thing, this, uh, I was wondering about this subjective experience when you are, uh, when you know very much about something like you can analyze a wine or you can, um, but it happens in other areas of your life when you are a, a priest for instance, and you are very used to hear people's scenes or things like that, or you are a lawyer and you are used to see how people struggle between each other. So it's kind of like uh, you lose some faith in, 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 the, in, in, in the most important thing of this area. It's like a wine taster. You are so good in analyzing the wine and then I ask you, do you like it? Well, I don't know. So, like this subjective experience is something different from the cognitive aspect of that. And you said, well, we have to learn to reconnect at that. And the question is, do we really learn that? Or it's like, uh, there's, the others say, that, uh, say, which says that like, uh, ignorance is a blast. Well, you, you really don't know, you just experience. Yeah. And to reconnect, could be just disconnect from the cognitive knowledge and to experience again, so. I think, I think you, it is learning, but it's not conscious learning. So it's association. The brain is making associations. And there are moments where you now can get everything together, okay, when you can combine. The same is true in people who are learning to play chess. At first, they'll look at every move one by one and they'll think what happens and then they'll think of four moves ahead. And eventually by the time you're a grand master, you look at the board and you kind of see possibilities. And that just happens, but it doesn't just happen by accident, it happens by having thousands and thousands of trials until 
the brain has made those associations and now it's ready to put it together. So I think that's what happens. We don't have to consciously, cognitively try to connect them, but we have to have lots and lots of repeated trials and then it will happen. That's the brain's job. The brain's job is to put things together. It's always trying to put information together. It's getting information from all the senses all the time, bombarded, stimulated, and it's trying to figure out what's going on out there, and it never stops in that task. Thank you. Any more questions? One, two more. Can you hear? Yeah. So, uh, I was wondering how uh, ghost limbs relate to multisensory perception, or, or how, you know, when someone doesn't doesn't have an arm but they still feel like they had one, so they have a sense of touch, although they can touch an arm that doesn't exist. So, so this is this is phantom limb. Oh, yep. Yeah, phantom limb. So phantom limb is probably a different story, but um, what we think of phantom limb now is best explained by um, the forward model or the Bayesian brain, where you're not just getting information coming in from your senses, which you then try to work out a, a, a model of. You're also, by repeated inputs, you've generated expectations and uh, prior expectations of what's going to happen, and you send that information down, and when the information comes in from the bottom, it either matches and it confirms your prior expectation and you don't pay any more attention to it, or it mismatches, and now I do have to pay attention. So for example, when I pick up this bottle, not consciously, but when I do it unconsciously, I'm not really aware of the feeling in my fingertips because there's no point. I, I, I don't notice it because I'm expecting, I'm expecting to, f to have sensations from my fingertips in my, the forward model is predicting that's going to happen as I launch the action. So when the information comes in, it cancels out that expectation and everything's okay. But if I put my hand down to get the bottle and there was suddenly something slimy and not what I was expecting, I'd, ugh, I would think, oh, what's that? And I'd have to revise my expectations very quickly. Now, things can go wrong. We think, well, my colleague Chris Frith, neuroscientist, thinks that when people have an uh, anarchic hand, this is where they say, I didn't perform this action, my hand performed it, you know, I didn't do it, someone's controlling my arm, it lifts and drinks brings the bottle to my lips, Not, it wasn't done by me. He thinks what's happening is you haven't got a copy that gives you expectations about what's going to be felt next. So when those sensations come in, they surprise you and you think it's not me because I wasn't getting what I expected to get. And in the case of phantom limb, it's another kind of mismatch and I'm not getting signals from the from the arm so I'll send a few more signals down there come on come on wake up feel something feel something and that information is not just coming from the arm it's coming from all the muscles higher up as well that tell the brain where to expect the arm to be when it's when when there's tension or movement so, so it's as if the brain is not getting, it's not getting input signals and instead of it changing its prior, it sticks with that expectation that there is information there and it doesn't revise. So it doesn't revise ever because I met a woman who had lost her arm in a, a traffic accident, a road accident, and she had her arm severed some 30 years ago and she says when I wake up in the morning I still have to look to see which arm's the real one because they just feel as though they're both there right she can't turn that off but the other interesting thing about 
all of this is um, you, th you think, and I think, that when we touch a surface, we feel in our fingertips what it feels like. So I can think I'm touching wood, I can think I'm touching metal, or I'm touching glass, or I'm touching wood, and it's as if I'm just getting that from the fingertips. I'm not. You don't have wood and glass sensors on your fingertips. You don't. And what's even more interesting is people who have an accident at work and the hand is cut off very quickly and you take the hand and you take them to the hospital and you stitch it back on very, very carefully, they have no feeling in the skin at first. But if you get them to touch the table, they'll say, oh, I can feel glass or I can feel wood. How are they doing that? And the answer is how much the wrist is depressing, how much force and pressure you're using, how much information is coming from the other tendons and muscles. And we knew this, even though that seems remarkable, we knew this. Aristotle told us, when you're on rough ground and it's dark and you feel with a walking stick, is the ground rough, are there stones? Where do you feel the sensations? And the answer is, at the end of the stick, you just extend that information, you project it. So that's also what we're doing normally, projecting information from the top. So phantom limb is really a, a sort of controlled hallucination, but it doesn't turn off as it should when it's not getting counter information. That's what we think. So uh, I was just going to add to the uh, to the the talk about uh, uh, I'm going to add uh, there's some studies that say that before you have uh, or people that don't have um, musical study they perceive uh, the music in a different part of the brain than someone who has a musical study and uh, the funny thing is is that after you had musical study you start analyzing music. Uh, with, um, with the part of the brain that does the, the analysis, not anymore with, uh, with the emotional part. And the funny thing is that you can't go back, so it's kind of, uh, you know, the musicians will never use the, the other part as they did use when they didn't have the musical study. Just uh, that's uh, some really curious stuff. So, like, if you learn music, you won't never feel it the same way you did before you learn it. <laughs> that's right, and we know that um, very often your ability to perceive music is increased enormously by making music, by performing. So it's not just knowing or being a musician by hear hearing. It's also by making music. So it may be the fact that you've, you're not just hearing, but you're doing perception and action is why you're using different parts of the brain and also why you're, you're engaging them. The emotional thing I think is interesting because we all feel emotions in music, right? I mean, don't we? Uh, it's kind of difficult. But a lot of professional musicians, some of them become so technically advanced that they say they don't feel the emotions. And the ones who are the really great ones are often the ones who the rest of us say, ah, there's more emotion in that music. That's very technically good, but there's more emotion. And the question is, how do we judge the emotion? Especially on piano. The only thing you can do to a piano is push the key down. Mm -hmm. But people say, oh, that's softer. And it's not the pedal. And they say, well, I'm playing with my hands in a soft way. No, you have to press the key to make the sound. So it's timing. It's timing between striking the keys that must be making a difference. Uh, and that's making a difference to our awareness, mm -hmm. our emotional awareness. I there's some, the, in, the same, in the same group of studies, there's some really interesting stuff about emotion and music. Because yeah. yeah. you can uh, pick groups of people that don't understand anything about music, yeah. and you show them certain uh, chord pro progressions. And they also, they always identify a chord pro progression as happy or as sad yes. the same way. Yes. So there are certain chord progressions that are always sad for everyone, even though they don't know music. And that's re careful, really awesome. Careful, careful. So um, 
Yes and no. It turns out that not every culture, not every culture identifies the minor key as sad. Oh. It could be America, North America, yeah, stuff yeah, yeah. from the people but, but, from but, study. But, but they do have something in common. They do have something in common. In, in uh, uh, Western music, uh, quite often, m most of the music, predominantly most of the music is in the major key. When you go into the minor key, it marks a significant change. And it's often a change that mirrors changes in the heart, right? Because when you, when you suddenly have an emotion, things change. You get quieter. You go slower. You feel sad. And when music does that, it's mirroring the physiological state of you. So when you go to minor key, it, it tells us something has changed. Pay attention. Now, in Arabic music, most Arabic music is in the minor key. When they change to the major key, they hear it as sad because it's a change. So it's changing from what's the usual uh, common uh, uh, chord register to something different. That's when you recognize it as sad. In, the, in that study, uh, which I can't name who did it, but in that study, they identified on the, that group of people uh, that uh, fast tempo and yes. major chords yes. uh, are happy. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is David Huron. I think this is David I'm Huron's not sure, but then uh, fast tempo and dissonance gives anguish and, yes. uh, and yes. slow tempo, minor chords yes. give a feeling of mel uh, melancholy or yeah. like uh, sadness yeah. or... Yeah. Calm. Because it's, because it's mirroring the physiological state, yeah. Mm -hmm. So as I said, when you're in a state of sadness, you go slower, you're quieter, you're not as loud. But if you're in a state of grief, <laughs> it's sharp. Mm -hmm. And when you make that in music, that's anguish, that's grief, right? So quite often, how does music have emotions? It has emotions by mirroring our physiological changes, but not only that, when we listen to music, music entrains the heart. The heart starts to follow the patterns in the music. Its rhythm changes, so we're actually starting to feel the emotions in the music. So I think that's why music's emotional, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barry, and thank you very much to all of you that were uh, today afternoon and in this evening, night, almost. <laughs> and uh, I just, uh, I want to thank you very much, Barry, being here this whole week. Next week, we will be again with Barry uh, in our um, colloquium on cross-modal perception. So I invite you all to be here again. And for tonight, that's it. Muito obrigado.